get back to Jeff because he didn't yeah. officially introduce himself. Oh, I, I would make a great waiter. Whatever, you know. I work here. Mash uh, <laughs> meetings. My turn. Uh, I used to write some rest code, but then I'm just this is my director job. So if everyone on Trent, um, I work in the Windows kernel on C++, so I want to write Rust. So I'm a fair community of these thoughts. So <laughs> um, I also often leave early, so when I get up and leave, just ignore me. Right. Or just go out right when he does, that way there's not a lot of commotion all at once. <laughs> so you, you work on the Windows kernel? Yeah. For, yeah I'm you, do you know um, Jonathan Kunky? Okay. We go to see Rust or drivers over those I just have to go like, like no. There's some internal effort towards it, yeah. No Bill Gates. <laughs> I've never <laughs> had Bill Gates, but I've seen his houses. Oh. Like, how? <laughs> like you've seen inside his houses or outside. So when I joined Microsoft they put us on this big boat and they like put they like shipped us in front of their house with like Costco pizza and beer and we were all just like looking at it. And <laughs> 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 so this is what we're building here, man. <laughs> One day all this <laughs> you want to make sure there's four hundred yards of water between the 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 I didn't see Bill, but I saw it, all of his security guards staring at us from like his lawn. So I just, did they give you water balloon launchers? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Were there any AKs? Not that I could see. Okay. Uh, I even work at Wii U. Uh, I've never done any cross. I'm excited to be here and learn something. That's the right place to be. <laughs> so I'm at Hall, I say hi. Hey, Steve, I'm sorry. So I'm at Hall, I say hi. I will. I work with them a lot. I work with them in all the language. John, so much. Okay, that's quite a few audience says. Mm -hmm. Todd? I do stuff. My name's Todd. <laughs> I also do stuff. I didn't know what we were doing today. I just showed up. I didn't even bring a laptop. Dang. Mm -hmm. My name's Jacob. Good to be here. <laughs> I, used, I used to work at Weave. Wait, still there? No. He's gone. gone. Um, it's been a while, so. Um, Wait, don't cut in line. What? No, no, Levi comes next. No, no, it's actually like this. No, no, Levi comes next. So, I, I program Rust for a living full time. That's pretty nice. I've, I've given them some embedded Rust presentations here. Long time. Thank you, media comer. So, if you come again, you'll get to see my smiling face. That's a that next great motivation for you. But my name's Levi. I don't know when we're doing it next. Um, I'll have to think about it. There's there's some issues around getting some pills now. I think. I still have a bunch. You still have a bunch. Yeah. yeah. There are also a bunch of other interesting, fairly cheap microcontrollers that we might do. The Raspberry Pi Picos, there's cool stuff. I don't know if those are still available as readily, but I don't know. It's my turn now? Yeah, now it's your turn. <clears throat> I do Scala for my day job and I do rest um, the rest of the day. Um, my name is Matt. Is that what Batman does too? I don't think Batman is Scala. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm a, a mathematician and uh, I pretend to be a software developer uh, yeah. to make a living, you know, mostly doing web development. But um, I'm, uh, although I tend to do PHP and JavaScript and, and Python, I'm yeah, curious about going and invest in some of the other alternatives we know. Awesome. My name's obvious. All right. Do you used to work at Jive? Yeah, I did. Okay. I recognize the name. Well, let's see. I was there for a couple of years. Well, with um, 20 seconds uh, on the clock before we officially get started, and I'll let you introduce your, yourself there. All right. Um, the audio wasn't on for the first part, so I want to say again for those uh, that are joining in online 
So we're doing a, a crash course in Bevy, which is a 3D library slash framework, framework for Rust. And this is under the auspices of Vivint that's hosting us and providing Visa and Jeff that, that does the uh, making sure that we have a room and, and that we have pizza. Yeah. So again, thank you to Jeff and to Vivint for that. Go signing the corner there. Um, and then I will let you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us what we're doing. All right, so I am Nathan Stocks. I am a software developer at, you know, a real day job, but the rest of the time I teach Rust and I write things in Rust and have lots of fun with Rust. Today we are going to have a crash course in Bevy, which is a game engine written purely in Rust, which is pretty freaking awesome. It's pretty early days, so it's code only, no <laughs> editor or fun stuff like that yet. Uh, but yeah, for those of you who don't know Rust yet, I'm sorry, we're just diving straight into deep and we're actually not going to teach anyone how to do Rust today. I do teach crash courses though, and I will give a free code in Discord tonight when I get home. So look for that and you're welcome to go take that. That's a great way to get into Rust. Um, I don't really care, like I'm happy to give away free to anyone who asks, so I do that quite often. All right, so Bevy. It's like the top course on YouTube. Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I've got a, I've got a top selling, top rated, two, two, Rust courses. It's not like my. Not Sorry. Man. Well, mine are called <laughs> Ultimate Rust Crash Course and Ultimate Rust Two. So that's why you win. It's in the name. So you got that quick thing going. Yeah, it's the name. It's all the name. It's all it is. Okay. Anyway, uh, here's the website for Bevy. Maybe I'll even zoom. The other way. Sorry, not used to this keyboard. So Bevy, BevyEngine.org is the website. If you want to, you know, take a peek at it. I'm not really going to read pages to you, but Bevy is a refreshingly simple, data-driven game engine built in Rust. It's free and open source. And full disclosure, I am biased. I am a sponsor, and I've also contributed to Bevy here and there. So there are other game engines out there. Uh, this is the one that I like, but feel free to try others as well. Um, what we're going to make today is we're gonna make a little game with some Kenny assets, or you know, you're, you're welcome, of course, to sort of go off on your own and do your own thing, substitute any different graphics or sound or whatever. But uh, if you wanna follow along, go to Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y dot N-L, <clears throat> Click on this Assets tab here up in the top right. Let's zoom in so people can see this. And then in the search, type Rolling. And it's this one right here, Rolling Ball Assets. Now, if you use Kenny a lot, like I do, I encourage you to donate to support them because uh, that's awesome. Then they keep doing stuff already done my donation so I'm just gonna download it you don't have to donate this. that's fine anyway that's gonna download a zip file we're gonna open up that zip file and inside of there we're going to go into the PNG subdirectory the default subdirectory and we're gonna grab a couple images we're gonna get this ball blue large this ball red large and this block corner and there's a fourth one, but it, you have to scroll down a little bit. Fourth one is whole large end. So those are the four images we're going to use today. So if I can get my... What was the quest? It's I did default. Yep. I'll get these over into VS Code and then I can zoom in and you can see it better. So in, in your project, oh, by the way, you need to do, you know, make a project. You need to put these three dependencies in there. If you haven't already, uh, I will go over that in just a second. But let's go ahead and you need to make an assets with an S directory and put those graphics in there. So I'm going to grab those, put them in assets. There's the names zoomed in more. Ball blue large, ball red large, block corner. And whole large end. 
Correct. And if you look at them, it's a blue ball. That's going to be player zero. There's a red ball. That's player one. Computer science here, so it's player zero and one because we're talking about the implementation. There's this little triangle, which is going to be like a, a thing you can bump into. And this is the place you're trying to get this hole at the end. Spencer. Did it work well with those? I don't think Bevy supports SVGs. Okay. Like don't use... Yeah, it supports like your four most common raster okay. formats. So like PNG, BMD. There are some Bevy SVG crates. A couple others. There's a few tessellators or whatever that can like render them. I'm sure there's a plugin if you really want to. <laughs> Just use PNG. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> and then we're going to use, I'm only going to use one sound. You're welcome to grab more. The sounds are also here. If you click on the assets tab on Kenny again and go to audio over here, it is impact sounds. So download that and open that zip file and let's see which one did i want to use I'm trying to remember it was one of the glass i think it was glass two impact glass heavy two i believe let's know my sound and see you don't want to record the sound effects again you certainly can but i'm not going to bother today but not here favorite. Yeah, that's the one. You don't want to go pew, pew, pew again? <laughs> well, we're not firing. It's, 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 a, so it's a dong. Do I mean, it could, but... All right. So it's, it's the Impact Glass Heavy 2. So I'll get this into VS Code and zoom in for you. All right. Impact glass heavy 002.org. And that's all the assets that I'm planning to use. If we have extra time, we can do more stuff, but quite frankly, we've only got an hour and a half till nine. So it'll be amazing if we just get through the stuff I plan. Okay. Dependencies. You need Bevy, Bevy Rapier 2D, and Leafwing Input Manager. If you use Cargo Add, it'll fill in the version numbers for you. I highly recommend Cargo Add. It's super cool. It just got added to Rust like two releases ago or something. Really awesome. And you can't pass all three to Cargo Add. In <gasps> can you? Yeah. That's awesome. I wasn't sure, so I tested it. One nice. Today I learned. Like you could do, like you could do, like, uh, Serialize as a feature, and anything that has a serialize will get it, or you can do it like per package slash serialize or whatever. Oh, yeah, it's cargo add is awesome. It's, it's seriously you awesome. You need to like add a convert zone or something? Yeah. Okay, so now we're sort of in here. So I'm going to go to source main.rs, get rid of the print line, and we're going to start coding. I'm going to put this into presentation mode. All right, is that zoomed in enough that y'all can read it we okay with this size one more, one more? Yeah. Well, that was the wrong button how was that how about that that's good okay so first thing we're want, going to want to do is uh some use statements we want to use our preludes so it's the same for all three so so bevy prelude star and bevy rapier 2d let's see if my lap little lappy top can ever have rust analyzer catch up with me today i miss my desktop and leaf wing now here's an interesting artifact the the crate name has dashes in it but crates in code can't have dashes so if you ever see a dash in the name in code you have to use an underscore and yay, Rust Analyzer finally caught up. Okay, so there's a three preloads. It's going to bug us for a while about unused stuff, but we'll use it all. All right, the core of Bevy is the app. So you, everyone needs an app new. And just sort of like the, the hello world for a Bevy app is you add plugins, plural, 
the default plugins and you call run. Now, if you compiled or dependencies for now, then you should be able to go cargo run. Oh, by the way, I should have been specific. You want to compile in release mode. This is a game engine. It's doing a lot of stuff. If you compile in debug mode, it's going to have problems. It's going to get sluggish on you. So just compile it in release mode. So you can just do dash R or dash dash release. Even for the 2D stuff? You, I mean, kind of depends. If you've got a if you've got a a brand new silicon Apple Silicon Mac, you might be okay. But you got something a little weaker, you're probably not. Gonna be. Yeah, then you might be okay. But I just just run it in release mode. You know, you're gonna cheat your battery nicer too. Anyway, you'll you'll get a blank window, and it just says app at the top, and then you just close the window. So there's our hello world for a, a bevy app. Okay, so might as well do a little customization here. We're going to insert a resource. So a resource in in bevy terminology is something that is sort of, sort of you can think of it as just a mutable global. A resource is just something that sort of hangs out. And so bevy uses resources for a lot of its settings. So it has a lot of different structs that affect a lot of different settings. And if they're if they're present in the resource, then it will customize your settings. So we're going to insert a resource called window descriptor. And if you're in VS code, you can use the build struct fields if you want to, but you don't really need to because we only care about one of these. The one we care about is title. Well, you can also like change width and height of your window if you want to, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to get this title one. Everything else, I'm going to do the struct update syntax to take the defaults. And I'm just going to customize the title. So we're going to call this like a uh, rolling game, or something like that. And it needs to be a string. So we can use the into trait to change that into a string. And voila. So if you run it now, all that changes is, gosh dang it, why does it keep coming back over here? Stop it. The very top of this window now says rolling game instead of app. Okay, so now we've introduced the hello world and what a resource is. You can act, you can add your own arbitrary structs as resource. Uh, that's that can be really useful for things like game state or something that's not like attached to something in the game. Like let's say you have a like a, a score. <laughs> You might want to make a struct to like keep track of your score, like overall scores or something, and just update that or something. But uh, we're not going to do a whole lot more with resources. In fact, I think that we're pretty much done with uh, mutating them anyway. We might read a couple. All right, next, let's go ahead and add a startup system. So right here near the end, I'm going to say add startup system and the name of our system is going to be setup so a system in this is actually an ECS term I'll talk about what an ECS is in a little bit a, uh, a system is just a function that runs at some point so we're going to call this function setup did this reset my font size to back smaller a little bit? It's okay. It's okay? Is, is it okay to the people yeah, in the back? Okay. Um, okay. So setup. And what do we want to do in our setup? Well, we need access to some commands. So we're going to do a mute commands commands. I'm going to hand wave a little bit. That's used to spawn things. And we also want an asset server so we can get access to those images. So we're going to say asset server, which is a resource of type asset server. At this point, if you save, Rust Analyzer should be happy, other than the warnings that you're not using things. So a startup system runs once at startup. So 
startup systems are for setting stuff up. So I named this guy setup. Like there's nothing special about the name other than it lets me know what it's for. Uh, first thing we want to do is we want to get a camera because uh, Bevy is a general 3D game engine. We're going to make a 2D game. So we, we're going to set up a 2D camera. So 2D camera. We're going to go commands, spawn bundle. And we're going to give it a camera 2D bundle default. So I'm calling the default on camera 2D bundle. And that is going to set up our camera. So now if we run again, instead of that black background, by default, when you actually start rendering things, it's gray. So you can tell, oh, I've got a camera looking out at the gray nothingness of my game engine now. All right, I'll keep this on the screen for those who are still still catching up to hit there. And we're going to keep going. Create nothingness. <laughs> Create nothingness of Levi's soul, huh? My goodness. All right. What brings uh, camera 2D into uh, the namespace? That... It's uh, the Bevy Prelude. Our use Bevy Prelude star. Mm. Are you seeing? <clears throat> are you having trouble? On yours? Yeah, but you can keep going. Okay. At the ball. very top, you should have this. The use Bevy Prelude star. And that will bring that camera 2D bundle into, into scope. That's where we get window descriptor, default plugins, app, camera 2D bundle, commands, asset server, res. Those are all from the yes. Bevy Prelude. And you can tell that... <laughs> So far, there's not a lot of Rust, but we've already hit like what? A dozen game engine concepts? This is why I built Rusty Engine for my students who are learning Rust, is so that they wouldn't have to learn all the game engine crap just to practice Rust. So, but this is way more powerful once you know Rust. Okay, so we wanna spawn our, play, our player now. We wanna do something interesting, right? So spawn player. Let me get up my reference here so make sure I don't go off track. Okay, so once again, we're going to do a commands dot spawn bundle. Like this time, it's going to be a sprite bundle. So sprite is your two D game engine concept that's an image and a translation and a rotation and a scale and sort of like all that basic stuff so you can deal with an image in your 2D game space, right? And the sprite bundle we're going to do um, literally. So we'll give it our braces here. Once again, if you want, you could do like a fill struct fields. The things we actually, we only care about on this one are the texture and the transform. So I'm gonna delete the rest of these and just use our struct update syntax to take the defaults for everything else. And then we'll come back in here and say, okay, transform. That's where it's going to be. So by default, with the, with this uh, default 2D camera, zero, 0, is going to be in the center of the screen. And every 1.0 in floating point space is going to be a pixel, a logical <laughs> pixel. So if you're on a retina screen, that'll actually be two pixels. If you're on a, a lower res screen, it'll be an actual pixel. Um, okay, and then transform, we want to use a literal transform, and we're okay. Let's see, no, we want to say from translation. So transform is a game engine concept that combines, combi combines translation, rotation, and scale. So that's what a transform is. So translation is where you are, rotation is which, where, you're, where, you're, where you're facing, and scale is how big or small you are. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to create a transform with just a customized translation. We're going to say, okay, uh, we can leave, well, let's, let's set them on the left a little bit, negative 150 and then zero, zero. And then the Z coordinate um, in, in the default camera is going to be your depth. So it's going to be from zero to 999. 
So if I put depth at 1.0, then anything lower than 1.0, he'll be on top of. So that's important when you're like overlapping that end goal circle. You want you want your player to go on top of it, not behind it, because that looks really weird if it goes behind it. Um, translation takes it back for you, buddy. Uh, what I do wrong? It's so wrapping it back three. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. I've got a question. Back three knew those three things. In a lot of in a lot of two D games, you can mm -hmm. go into a cave, right? Uh -huh. And when you go into the cave. You're both above and below it at the same time. Does that manage through transparency, or how does that type of thing work? However, the programmer wants to manage it. How would you manage? It? Usually, you're you're actually you're 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 taking away everything from when you were outside and and you go in. It depends on what well, you're what doing. I mean, what I mean is, as you enter into a cave, your character's head goes underneath. And into the cave. Okay, now, that's going to be with you layers. Clip through, how do you not clip through an object? Z value. Well, then you're, you're going to put the top of your door at a different Z value than your character, which is at a different Z value than the, the tile that's underneath them. So it's just all with that layering. Okay. So you can actually take a 2D game and, and, and view it in a, in a 3D camera. And if you sort of turn it, you'll see like all these distinct layers where, pe where the programmers or artists and designers are just layering different gra graphics on top of each other. A lot of uh, discovery videos around like old video games do this. Like, what are this is how the NES game blah works, and it'll split that out and yeah. show you all the layers of the sprites being processed. And... At the end of the day, there's no like right way to do it as long as it looks nice. Yeah, if you like how it looks, then you did it right. You know, all right, our texture that's our actual texture. So, this is where we're going to get our asset server and load the texture. Now, it's with respect to the assets directory. That's just built in. Like there's a way to customize it, but we're just gonna use the default. You make the assets directory, you put your stuff in it, and then you can say, what What do we call that? It was... Ball blue small. Thank you, ball blue large. Blue large PNG. Well, if you got a small one, then you better put small on yours, but. <laughs> All right. And we need a semicolon here. And then we're happy. Okay. So that's just like our basic, we spawned a sprite. It has an image, it has a location that we chose. Everything else is default. So if we go and run it, so it stays on the screen-ish, run it. Why does it keep doing that? My soul is no longer empty. Apple knows which desktop it should show better than you do. I guess. Anyway, so there it is, right? We got our graphic, it's on the screen. So yay. So now let's do a, a couple other things with it. Let's make a component. Well, a struct that will be a component. We're just going to call it player. And we're just going to derive component. So here's probably a good time for us to talk about ECS. So ECS um, for game engines is sort of like SQL for you know, web apps. It's a way to deal with your data, to act to query and access your data. And it's really analogous to a relational database. E, and the ECS stands for entity. That's like your ID on your row. C is your component. That's like all the rest of your columns. Your columns are components. And S is your system. That's your functions, where you're actually dealing with your entities and components. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, there's a new component player. And on this spawned entity, when we spawn something, it spawns an entity and then it attaches components to it. So like the transform is a con component and the texture is a component and all the other junk that it had, they're all components. We're going to add a one more content component with insert component. Come on. Did I not do it right? Is it just insert? Yeah. Okay, it's just insert. They keep renaming it. Every, every every release of Bevy changes quite a few names. All right, and then we're gonna in, insert the player one. So what this is gonna do is so in our on, on our other systems, systems that run every frame, we can run queries and say, I wanna I wanna get the the entity that has the player component on it. 
And then I can deal with its position or its rotation or whatever the heck I want to deal with with it. So I'm, this is a marker component just to say, this is my player. This is a player. All right. So let's see. Let's make it so we can move it, shall we? So I'm using this leaf, leaf wing input manager to simplify uh, input management a little bit. So we're going to start with game pads and then we'll add on keyboard and, well, probably just keyboard. So, okay, let's see. Do, do, do. So between this player and the rest of it, I'm going to insert a bundle. A bundle is uh, just a group of components. And this is going to be the input manager bundle. And this needs a special TurboFish type, and we're going to call it action. And I did this a little bit out of order, so we're going to need to go back up for a second. Let me close this. Okay, we're going to make an enum called action. This is just how the, how the input manager plugin works. It takes an enum where you define different input actions and our only input action is going to be a move because that's all we're going to do today is we're just going to move and <laughs> get ready for this we need to derive let me get the list on here to make sure i do it right this plugin is a little bit demanding all right first we're going to derive their special action like trait and then we're going to do partial equal, equal, clone, copy, hash, and debug. <laughs> Action like, partial equal, equal, clone, copy, hash, and debug. All right. Then we can go back to our map input manager bundle. And here inside your braces, we need to do both the action state and the input map. The action state is going to be pretty easy. It's going to be an action state colon colon default. The input map, that's where all the action happens. The input map is going to be an input map and we're going to start with a default and then we're going to insert a dual axis left stick and we're going to bind that to our action move and we're going to hard code gamepad zero so we're going to do a set gamepad. See if I can get it to move down vertical. Good. So set gamepad, and then the gamepad struct is going to have the ID zero. There's our player zero. And then after the set gamepad, you have to call build. This is a builder pattern. It's a lot. I know. If you get lost, I have a. I, I have actually gone through this. I went all through this ahead of time. The code is up on my GitHub repo. Uh, username clean cut repository rolling. So if you need to go and copy and paste stuff from there, not a problem. Okay. So all this is doing is it's saying, okay, if gamepad zero moves its left stick, map <coughs> that the two axes to the action move. So I'm going to have an X axis for my joystick and a Y axis that I can query somewhere else in a system and use it to actually move. But we're not going to get that input unless we actually go up to the top here and add plugin. Where is my plugin? What is that called? 
input manager plugin. Makes sense. Input manager plugin, and this needs the turbo fish with the action type. And then we call its default. So that plugin will handle dealing with the raw gamepads and then the config we gave it and handle all of the, the math and give us something nicer than we would with the raw inputs than we'd have with the raw inputs. So now that we've got the plugin doing the back, the sort of the back end stuff, and we've got this config for the plugin to use, now we can go and make a system to actually move stuff. So let's see. Well, except for I did that a little bit out of order. We're going to move it with physics, but we haven't turned on physics yet. So let's turn on physics first. Yeah, it's in a plugin. There's no physics in the game engine. Right <coughs> so what we're going to do is this Bevy Rapier 2D. Rapier is a physics engine. Bevy Rapier 2D is the plugin that uses Rapier to do 2D physics in Bevy. So we're going to do yet another uh, couple things here. We're going to add plugin, Rapier Physics plugin. And we're going to give it a no user data because we're not, we don't have any customized physics user data. And then we're going to call, what's that? Data or date? Data. Thank you. And then we're going to call pixels per meter and tell it that 200 pixels is a meter. So that sort of scales our physics to something that works decently. And like all the physics settings that I do today, like if you use physics in your own project, you're going to want to, yeah, you're going to want to sort of twiddle them to match the physics you're going after. All right, and then we're going to insert resource rapier configuration. We talked about how resources are often used as configs. Well, other plugins also use them as configs. So this rapier configuration struct as a resource has a field called gravity. And um, yeah, we want to turn it off. Because we're doing an overhead where you where you're looking down on a marble on a flat thing. Now, if you want to do like a side scroller where like your marble is moving across something like a platformer, then you probably want to leave gravity on. But we're we don't want it. So we're going to use vec two zero, which is just the constant for vec two new zero zero zero, and then defaults for everything else. So what what if you wanted? Uh the hybrid approach where you could still jump up and down jump but you are looking at it or top down that sure slantish then you have to deal with those directions and those forces on your own just a lot of people want a gravity heading down in 2d so mm -hmm. they just have it by default as a convenience but there's okay. nothing you can't do yourself with by applying your own global forces and things like that okay uh, and there's one more we want. We want also another plugin. This one uh, we're going to comment out a lot of the time, but sometimes we're going to want it. It's called Rapier Debug Render Plugin, and we're going to take its default. What that does is it is when it's present, it renders debug wireframes for uh, physics colliders and things like that. So while we're like setting them up, we want to see it, and then we'll turn it off by just commenting out this line. Okay, now that we have physics, we have to tell our sprite that it needs to participate in the whole physics thing. So we're gonna go back down to our spawning our player down here. Do -do -do. All right. So the first thing we need is a rigid body. So we're going to insert a component called rigid body. That's an enum. We're going to get say this is a dynamic rigid body. 
A dynamic rigid body is one that you can apply forces to and it moves around. So that's our player. And then we're going to insert a collider. And that is going to be a ball of radius 32. Our, if you, if you got the same PNG as me, it's a 64 by 64 image with a circle filling it up. So the radius is 32 for a circle. It's like the hitbox. Exactly. And then we want to say this sprite can have uh, external forces applied to it. So we're going to say we're going to insert an external force. And the starting force is going to be zero. So back two, because we're in 2D here, zero. And torque, which is like your angular velocity, is just going to be zero. So now it's got a rigid body a dynamic rigid body, so it can have forces. We said it will have forces, and we gave it a collider so that it can actually bump into other things. And the last physics things we care about is we want to add some damping. So we're going to insert a damping component so it doesn't just, like, go forever. So damping takes uh, linear damping, and I, I tried it out, 0 0.6 turned out to be pretty good. And angular damping. You say it doesn't go forever, is that like friction? Mm. Uh, friction would be how, if it's moving along another object while it's touching, how it would interact. Damping is literally just moving in space. Does it slow down? You can think of it as air, air resistance. Got it. Or rubbing on the table. Sure. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a good way to think about it. And then, oh, I'm sorry. One more physics thing. I was wrong. That wasn't the last one. We also want to set the restitution. By default, the restitution is zero. So, like, you hit something and you just stop. You know, it's like a watermelon hitting concrete, just like splat. Um, we want to do a restitution coefficient of 1.0, which is your ideal billiard ball you know it it bounces exactly the same <coughs> as what it what it came in with okay you down a so so that would be like a game of pong it's the wall and then <coughs> exactly and does that handle any sort of acceleration deceleration or just straight deflect straight straight bounciness so it's just saying if you run into something, it's just going to change its direction without losing any momentum or gaining any momentum. If you do it higher than one, it'll actually gain momentum, you know, like a powered bumper in a pinball machine. Um, uh, but it will have that linear damping still. So it will be constantly slowing down unless you're applying a force to it. Okay, we set up all that physics stuff. Now we need to go actually make it so we can move. I mean, we've done all this. I mean, we can go run it, but the only difference is you're going to see that debug render of the... Uh, ball collider. And if you look really carefully, you might not be able to see it on this screen. Look it off. What's that? It's got a little like X and Y axis in the middle, and then it's got that little outline, that sort of dark one. That's the collider. Hmm. Yeah, it's hard to see. Makes it look kind of like a claw. Yeah. yeah. And then if we go and we if once you're once you're sure like oh my collider is the right place and the right size and that's not the right button then you can just comment out the rapier debug render plugin run it again and none of those wireframes are there anymore although it'll probably do that but you see that doesn't have that the wireframe inside or outside all right let's go make it so we can move it so how how did it know that it was a circle as opposed to a square, but it's a PNG. Did I miss that part? Uh, we chose a collider that is a ball. So we chose that. Where is it? Right here. We said we want a collider that is a ball shape, which in 2D, the, the rapier is used for both 2D and 3D. So in 3D, that'll be a sphere. In 2D, it's a circle.
So, yeah, it's interesting. You have all the same names of everything, pretty much, um, in 2D or 3D. But with the 3D one, it's all 3D. It's a separate plugin. Yeah. But. So everything here, spot player, is the ball. All of those inserts relate mm -hmm. to the spawn bundle, the sprite bundle. Mm -hmm. Okay. All this stuff, it all has to do with this one entity. So the sprite bundle, that's just this much of it. That's a bunch of components that all sprites have. And we, we, we customized the transform, the texture, and took the defaults for the rest of them. Then we in inserted another bundle of components that the input manager uses. Then we inserted individually a bunch of components that the physics plugin uses. So I, I guess what I'm wondering is, would it be the same if I put commands in front of each of these? Or is the chaining specific to... Uh, if you got things? the entity out of the command, then you could you could call separate functions where you passed in the entity and then insert bundle. So spawn bundle returns an entity and each of the inserts returns the same entity. Uh, returns an entity commands, but it's, it's, yeah, you can think of it that way. Okay. Like as long as you keep chaining on the same spawn, you're dealing with the same entity. Got it. so spawn and then any number of things. Yep. All effects. That and then if you want spawn. something different, like this camera was its own entity. So it's got its own spawn. Can you give the camera inertia? <laughs> you could. Yeah, because uh, if you're doing like a multiplayer game with split screen, you'd have multiple cameras. You'd want to put components on them to identify which camera goes with which player. Mm -hmm. like so you can and tell which one needs to move and which one. <laughs> that is exactly how you do split screen, actually, is you, you instantiate multiple cameras. You set configs to say which part of the window they get to render onto and things like that. You can actually point them to um, textures on a mesh. It could be a 2D texture, it could be a 3D texture, and you could render your camera on that as well. That's how you do like portals, you know, like in the game portal, they render a camera view into an actual mesh. That's how Goldman works. <laughs> I, I bet they did something trickier. <laughs> in Nintendo 64, they were, still, they were still coding like mostly in assembly, I think, they were nuts. Uh, all right. What was that? Yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. All right. Uh, we're all, we've almost got moving stuff, so let's get to the moving. Uh, the Hello World takes a heck of a lot longer with the game. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it, it at some point like it starts to feel less boilerplatey, but at the start it's all boilerplate. Like you gotta figure out all these systems that you got to launch and get configured and start up. But like, if we have time today, we'll take this spawn player and we'll move it into a function and then we'll parameterize it. And then we'll just call it twice. Spawn player zero, spawn player one. And all of a sudden it'll start looking a little nicer. Like you start hiding, okay, my spawn player logic goes somewhere else. And I just call it spawn player. Right. I was going to ask, it seems a little bit odd that Rapier doesn't provide a bundle of sorts to say, here's all the things you need to set for a basic thing. Rather it doesn't having, know what you're going to use it for. Rather than having to know, I need no. to add all of these different pieces to make it work. Well, they, they do have default plugins, which is quite a few plugins. So they actually <laughs> are doing this somewhat, but... Rapier like, is? No, Bevy is. No, Bevy is. I'm talking about the Rapier stuff, because if you want to play in, after the Insert Bundle for Input Manager, everything after that is all stuff for Rapier, and you have to know that you need all of these pieces to make it work. This is going to be a nice candidate for a bundle of like basic 2D... And stuff and then you it yeah. lumps all that together. You could go propose it for the for the rapier plugins. Good. You could. I'd have to know enough about what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you would. That's true. Okay. We want to go and do some actual movement. So let's go do that. Let me go find my reference for that. Movement. Okay. So we're gonna make it const. I'm gonna call it move forth. This is just like how hard we're gonna push the ball when we're moving the joystick. And I'm gonna arbitrarily set it to what seemed to feel good to me, 1500. All right, and then we're gonna make a system, a function. I'm just gonna call it movement. This is gonna run once each frame. And we need uh, access to two things. This is uh, 
we're going to have our first ECS query here. So if you've ever done SQL, queries here are s analogous. They're definitely not the same, but they're analogous. We need a mutable query. And the way you do that is you call the <coughs> query struct and you parameterize it by, all right, the items we want to access are a reference to an action state parameterized by action. This is not the simplest query to start with. Sorry about that. And we need mutable access to the external force component. And we only want to get those on entities that have player component, but we don't actually want the player component. So it goes in the separate with thing. Whew. So there's the definition of our query. And we want access to time. So we want to get the time resource. All right, what did I do wrong? Probably unbalanced. We need another closing angle bracket over here. No, we need, well, yes, but we also don't need that. There we go. I had a, a friend over here that was unneeded. Okay, so this query gives us read access to the action state, write, read write access to the external force, and it will only turn up rows with our player component. So only players. All right. And then we want to say, okay, for every action state and mutable external force in our query and I'll explicitly call iter mute. I think you can do ampersand mute now, but I didn't test it, so I won't try it yet. Okay, so now we're looping through every player that has an action state and external force. Right now there's just one of them, but we're going to add a second player. So I'm setting it up so it will handle any number of players. Okay, so once we've got access to... And this is into the global ECS system. Exactly. You can think of the ECS as just like one huge relational database table. And a mute does Okay, good to know. So we have verified... Tell me your name again. Matt. Matt, that's right. Matt verified that you can actually just do ampersand mute right there instead of explicitly calling it a mute. You couldn't last version of Bevy. So I got used to typing it out explicitly. Ah, gosh dang it, I hate when I do that. Don't usually use this kind of keyboard, so everything's moved. All right, what are we doing? We gotta set those forces. So we need to get access to our access vector. So we're gonna get our access axis vector from action state Clamped axis pair. And we want to get the action move one. And it might not be there, but we know it's there because we hard coded it to be there. So I'm just going to unwrap it. And I want to turn that into one XY vec2. So that's what that's all doing is saying, okay, I'm getting this as a vec2. An X, Y. And then, now that we've got that as an X, Y, we can say, okay, the external force attached to our player, it has a force field. Uh -huh. <laughs> you set it to that axis vector. So everything, it's just going to point the same direction as wherever you're pointing the joystick. And it's going to be multiplied by the move force. That's how hard it's going to do it. And then we're going to rate that by time delta seconds. So as our frame rate jumps around, it stays perceptually smooth to us. This is axis vector. I would expect that to be two values, not a single value that could be multiplied. It was two values until we called this method on it. Is that two vector two? It's a vector. Yeah. But how can you multiply? 
to apply uh, a vector times an f32 multiplies the x and the y by the same f32 Rust supports uh, operator overloading yep in some fashion so the implementation of that too has a trait applied to it i forget what it is that mm -hmm. lets you apply the operator for multiplication to an f32 value and it will mm -hmm. handle applying the vector map correctly for that thing yep okay i did not know that so actually force dot force is a vector too yes cool. yes um have you done like a switch controller before? a nintendo switch <laughs> controller yeah. no um the next version of mac os that was just released is the first one to support connecting switch controllers to a mac and I haven't had hardware that would let me connect a switch controller until now, but it should work the same way. The only difference between a switch controller and an Xbox controller and a PS controller really is that the Xbox and PS4 have analog bottom triggers, right. while the switch has a, an on-off bottom trigger. Other than that, they have all the same effective stuff. I mean, there's a little bit of difference here in the middle, but... Mapping stuff. Yeah, but it all maps the same way in here. Okay, so we did it. Let's see it in action. Cargo run. Release mode. All right. Time for me to turn on my gamepad here. Dang it. Knock that off. Oh, man. I did something wrong. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we got to go up to the top and say add system. Add system. So a regular system runs every frame. And that's the movement system. Ah, none of that stuff. Just the name of it. Okay, now let's try it. And I'm going to take this out of presentation mode so it stops messing with me. It's so annoying. Oh, that's probably why. It's the whole full screenness. Yeah, because it wants. Yeah. All right, so there we go. Look at that. You can see the linear damping slows it down over time. If I hold on, it'll just keep adding force to it until it sort of hits its terminal velocity that the linear damping is imposing on it. But you can sort of roll the marble around, right? Yay. Cool. So were you bringing it back, or did you already set a boundary? Around? I brought it back because it's not very interesting once it's up. Can you go back to the code real quick? Mine's moving a heck of a lot slower than you. trying to figure out what it's Okay. Let's see, the, you have to set this pixel per meter to 200. The, um, the external, force, external force should start at zero. Linear, linear damping should be 0 0.6. Move force should be 1500. And you're multiplying axis vector times move force times delta seconds. Are you running in release mode? Dang, I don't know. All the way to 32? Sorry, did you scroll back up where you added it, the, system, the movement system? Uh, yeah, right there. Different controllers. Uh, it's the same. Uh, the input manager is supposed to normalize them all to the same also, I'm range. Using an Xbox. Yeah, yeah, this is an Xbox One controller. Oh. Huh, weird. I don't know what's going on. You, and you did rigid body dynamic, and you did. Oh, well. uh, could be. Are you on a high res screen or a low low res screen? That could make a difference. The whole ecosystem is pretty young, so any difference in our platforms can sometimes have an effect when they're not supposed to. All right. So we got we got a choice. For what we do next, we could add a little obstacle, like that, that little tri green triangle thing. We can add that and like be able to bump into it, or we could add, we could parameterize the whole player spawning and add a second player. Or choice number three, we can go add keyboard handling. Can we make golden eye? Right? <laughs> Maybe. You also run into some license. Depends on how far you get. I, I vote keyboard since most of us. You vote are... keyboard, you vote not keyboard. Well, I'm obviously a little selfish after that. Yeah. Both yeah. of us who read the instructions. Any other any other votes? I do have an extra controller too, so I'm almost a 
Well, let's just. I, I don't think my uh, D pad shows up. Let's just. Let, there's enough people without game pads. Let's still try the keyboard thing. I, oh, I think. <laughs> so I think that this is the whole point of an input manager is to make things easy. I think we can insert a virtual. There's a virtual D pad. D pad. And then what's the syntax? Do we need to do it explicitly? Oh, they've got WASD yeah. or arrow keys. So you can just throw yeah, them in. Constructors for virtual D pad. Keep calling, calling WASD on yeah. the virtual D pad. Oh, sweet. They got helpers. Nice thing about using plugins, huh? Cool. Uh, and we're going to map it also to action move. So either or. And there was another one too. Is that an arrow keys one? It is. Virtual D pad. My friend Ziklag actually contributed the virtual D pad mm -hmm. and the dual access functionality to this plugin. It was funny because I went to use the plugin. I'm like, it doesn't have access support. Then I went and looked at the pull request and he was writing the access support right then. That was cool. Okay, so now if we run it, da, 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 da. Yeah, arrows. Okay. WAST, that's working. And my gamepad, they all control the same thing. So, cool, huh? It was huh? worth the five seconds to have. <laughs> What's that? No, it was worth the sidetrack. Oh, it's totally <laughs> worth it. What was the second one? Uh, arrow keys. Arrow keys. And now we can move on to other real stuff. Okay, next vote. <laughs> Second player or triangle? Triangle. Triangle. Okay. So I'll go back into presentation mode to get maximum viewage here. So underneath the player, I'm just going <laughs> to spawn a triangle. All right. Make sure I don't miss anything here. Where is he? <laughs> this is going to be a little bit nicer than the player. This is just not quite as big. This is nice. Okay. Uh, whoa, don't fall down. There it is. Okay, so once again, commands, spawn bundle, sprite bundle. Let's see. Once again, we want the transform and the texture. Basically, everything from before. So. Yeah, you can copy and paste and modify it. It's going to be pretty similar. Uh, the transform, I don't know, we gotta, we gotta put it somewhere, so once again it's gonna be transform from translation back to new, and then we need, to, oh, sorry, back three in this case. Whoa, how did I get that red dot there? Go away. <laughs> I don't know what that is. It's probably a breakpoint or something. What did I hit you, that turned on a breakpoint? Break set on the left. Just click it. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, back th By the way, three. I, I look, there's a from XYZ that takes the three values and will wrap it for you. The transform from translation takes that three. There is a from XYZ function. Right here? Yeah. Sweet. Let's do it. And that one just takes the three after two. Nice. Nice find. There's tons and tons of methods. If you go and read through them all, like you'll discover. The problem is they change them <laughs> so often. So, okay. From XYZ, we want it to be, let's see, let's put the triangle over to the right and up. So that's gonna be positive, positive. So how about like uh, 150, 200, something like that. Would it have to be negative? Where is zero, zero? Zero, zero is in the middle. Okay. And it's like math class where X goes positive to the right and Y goes positive to the to up. 
it's not going to go I accept this though. No two two. Okay, good for me. And you could also always say same. No what? Origin. Yeah, yeah. I mean you rotate your camera around, it all changes. Yeah. You can have, do it however you want, but you have a left over front to see there for the front end Yeah, I sure do. Thank you. All right, texture is the same as for asset. Gosh dang it. Yeah, and we'll just put zero on this one. But make it go under the Yep. So if it overlaps the player, then it will go under. All right. Asset server load. Why does it not like asset server? What did I do wrong now? Wouldn't it be dot instead of colon colon? That's it. Thank you. All right. Block corner PNG. All right. So that'll be enough to get it to show up. In fact, we could run it real quick and just make sure got everything right. It'll show up, but we won't be able to interact with it yet because we didn't add the physics stuff. Does the compile time get painful once you start getting into a more full featured game? Um, not really. I mean, I'm sure if your game was huge, maybe, but it doesn't have to recompile the dependencies. Yeah. Just what you wrote. Like, we didn't write that much. So, okay. So it shows up. Let's make it so we can interact with it. You can, uh, you can also... Um... There's some hints that people have found. I forget where they are, but you can change the way that um, Cargo links so that it builds yeah. Bevy dynamically and then just links to the dynamic library, which saves a huge amount of time during the linking step. You can also use a faster linker. So as we talking about instead of instead of LLVM, or is that a faster? Uh, ZLD is the Mac OS. It depends on your platform. Mac's got a faster linker and different one on Linux, Linux different one on Windows. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of stuff you can do to increase compile times if you really care about it. You just have to be careful because they're all very platform specific. So I'm not going over any of that. It's fast enough for us. Okay, what are we doing? What are we doing? On pieces, we did the sprite. We need the collider. Okay, so insert. <laughs> this is where it might be worth going and copying and pasting. So there's a collider triangle and it takes a no. Thank you. Triangle. And it takes three vec twos. So vec two new 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 new. First one we're gonna do negative thirty two zero thirty two zero. This is relative to the center of the sprite. So first one is negative 32, 32. Second one is 32, negative 32, exactly the opposite. And the last one is negative 32, negative 32. 32, 32? Nope. And I got two inserts. It's the top left, bottom right, bottom left corner. 32, 32, top right corner, which is blank. Top left, bottom right. Bottom left. Yep. And then if we go and turn on our, whatchamacallit plugin, the Rapier Debug Render plugin, then you can actually see that it's a pretty imperfect triangle, but it's good enough for today. What was the last value for the back? Uh, negative 32, negative 32. So I don't know if you can see it, but it's actually cutting off the one side of the triangle because it sort of sticks out of center, but I don't care. Like if you, 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 if you move the ball up there, you'll see it overlap. Fixing this or using a, a, a more tightly fitted collider is an exercise for the reader, but I'm actually yeah. writing a plugin called ignominiously Bevy Rapier 2D Assets that will let you... It, have an editor to actually click around and create, create a collider mm -hmm. and then save it to a file have like a run and that. then have a plugin where you can load it from that file rather than have, than have to figure out all the code because it's a pain in the freaking butt. I, I would think this would be pretty simple. Just load the PNG, look for the edges and draw. Why can't you just automatically have it draw 
Oh sure, if you wanna if you wanna go integrate a tessellator into it, you can do that too. I don't know about tessellator. You'd use Lion. L Y O N. It's a tessellator. Extract your data like that as a bunch of pixels and translate it into like a uh, vector yeah. you can use in like collision detection and things like that. So Lion will take shapes that you define and tessellate them into triangles. Um, which is what you would sort of need to feed to the collider uh, machinery. But you are on the hook for figuring out how to take your PNG and getting the outline that you want and converting that into a shape in order, you know, with coordinates in order. So that then you can feed that to Lion, then feed that over to the underlying machinery of Rapier. Yeah, you can do all that if you want. Totally. I, and there are people that do that. What's the runtime cost to do that? Hi. Yeah, you shouldn't do it in runtime. You don't want to do that runtime. That's what asset pipelines are for. You want to get it all well, I'm, out I'm, into I'm, the I'm, file. For I'm surprised there's not a tool that you just give it a PNG and it gives you back. Here's the here's the, 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 the PNG. Oh, there are tools. I'm just not sure there's one for Bevy yet. Okay. Yeah, like how long? I, I would, guess, I would guess there's something you could upload on the internet. They could spit I mean, out something. You need to have to translate yeah. into something that could then get into the rapier. Oh, thing. sure. You, maybe you'd have to define. I mean, that. But in terms of rapier, has been out like six this months. Pixel is either yeah, transparent yeah. or it's <laughs> very violent. Like something to uh, <laughs> this rapier. <laughs> some standard representation. The alpha channel is not on or off. It is yeah. uh, full. We haven't added our rigid. Oh, right, right. but it works. It, cool. If it is at all called, I forget. There's a older there's thing all that is transparent. Well, if it is a, if it is all there wasn't all they renamed it not no that was that was in then it is a boundary. That's yes. part of it. So if you're looking for pixel perfect calculations on yeah, physics, I remember. then you need to marry. They did have an early name. With oh, it's in physics. your engine. It was in physics right. right. and lighter and and then you yeah, can start doing things like parsing PNGs or anything else pixel based and converting that to like let's finish this space. Primitives, or right, it? blocks, or whatever. But you're more commercial that, already. It's all very like a, all right. building on assumptions in your engine and the things that you're deciding. So it's like not a general practice. We're you're inserting your assumptions. Well, we're explicitly telling it that it's a fixed rigid body. I think that's the default. But a fixed rigid body is like immovable. Things can bump into it, but it will never move. All right, and we're going to insert that same restitution restitution coefficient 1.0, just like the other one. And that's enough for our triangle. Now we got our fully bouncy triangle. Here we go. Gosh, dang it. Go back to presentation mode. Yeah, I did. Boing. Boing. They're, they're totally different data structures. Yeah. All right. The rest of the on my ball is analog. You make the triangle like 0.5. It averages them. Oh. So, so by default, make it like the default is zero, right? So if you leave one, yeah, one, and one zero, and they bump into each other, their restitution is 0.5. Okay. You've been loaded. So I, I set them both to one because I want them to have that idealized billiard ball physics. Whatever. And then, like, if you want to do like a I like a pinball machine powered, you know, bumpers, then just give it like a restitution of like fifty or something. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's like runs it a little bit. Something nuts. Okay, time for player one. Not player zero. Yeah, I'm gonna grab this whole spawn player thing. What did you zoom in? Just go. All right. I am making a function called spawn player. This is not a system. This is just a function. And I'm going to plop in that whole spawn player stuff. And of course, we're going to need to give it some parameters. Uh, first thing we need is an ID. That's going to be a U size. So we can tell is this player zero or is it player one? Or is it player two or three or whatever? Um, and then we. We probably don't want them like on top of each other. So let's give it a location. And I'm just going to call that a vec2 because we're going to extend it ourselves. And then we need uh, that commands. We need a commands. That's going to be a mutable reference to commands. And we need an asset server 
which is going to be a an immutable reference to a resource source, which is an asset server. And that's going to go all vertical on us. Okay, now it's almost done because that's mostly all the stuff we're using already. We need to go to this transform from translation and it's going to be the location you pass in and we're going to extend it extend it to a 3d vector at layer 1.0 and then this gamepad id down here now just becomes id we can use the, the shorthand right if you have field name variable name and they're the same name you can just put the name so now we've got Gamepad 0, Gamepad 1. We've got different locations that are passed in. Is there anything else we need to... Oh! Right. The, um, we don't want to move both of them with the same keys. See that? So we're going to want to parameterize that. So I probably just do it like... <laughs> let's just do it like right inside of it. It should be like... If... Yeah. If ID is... <coughs> zero, then you get the WASD one, right? Uh, come on. Dangerous. Else you get the other one. Get rid of that. Did I do all of my extra? What did I do wrong now? Where? On that line. Move after move. Um, that doesn't look right. Oh, do they need to be tuples? They need to be insert. Is can we can we not do an expression inside of there? Oh, that doesn't go on the inside. It needs to go after the block. Comma, action, move. Is it happy now? Hey, cool. And now we can go up to here and for spawning our player, we can go spawn player zero vec to new negative 150 zero and then give it a mutable reference to commands and a immutable reference to asset server we got a funny comment in the chat, by the way. What the funny comment? says, you know, the Great Wall of China was a rigid body until Genghis Khan found that if he increased his velocity, he could skip past their walls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we didn't enable continuous collision detection. So if you have that problem of skipping through things at great speeds, you'll need to enable continuous collision detection. It's one of the settings for Rapier. All right, so now we're spawning a player zero at negative 150 and a player one at 150. And it just so happens I have two game pads. Would you like to control one of them? Let's get out of presentation mode and go cargo run R. And if we did it right, oh, we know what else we need to parameterize? What color? The image. Yep. But see that? We can bump into each other. We can bump to that thing. Okay. Parameterizing the image. So the exact same thing. Let's do like uh, inside the spawn player. Let image equals image. If ID is zero, then this, else, this, but change the color to red. Oh, we got to turn off the debug rendering. Ah, I'm blue. So for images that are this simple, uh, what about just generating a red circle rather than loading this asset? Uh, is that too complex? Yeah, yeah. actually, there is limited support for generating shapes that was just added. So you could do that now. 
It's actually harder to generate shapes than it is to load images. Just turn off the sprite so bundles only... and then leave the debug renderer on and call it wireframe. You could do that yeah. too, actually. So yeah, like we have the beginnings of an actual playable thing. Capitalize on it. Now we publish it to the App Store and make money. Release it on a wasm, like a wasm, right? Like really easy. You should good, yeah. So it like it just, <laughs> might be a bit of a stretch, but there is a betty wasm. Is everything betty right it's now? It's actually wasm pretty dang easy. Or does that limit your plugin that you use and stuff? Uh, as long as the plugins don't pull something that's not wasm compatible, then you're good. So if you use the yeah, Eddie yeah, Games Jam, then a bunch of people mm -hmm. release wasm games. Yeah. In then, fact, if you use the Bev B. While you guys talk, sure. show the code. I was still copying. Abs absolutely. <laughs> Sorry. But it's a great way around like the Apple Store. Yeah, I always show ads. Sorry, I'm making money on this. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, no one has written an ad plugin yet. <laughs> yet. <laughs> well, I need to get on that if they want to sing and be popular. <laughs> Nobody's going to use it until you can make money with it. I don't know. There's a lot of people using it. <laughs> anyway, I was going to say there is a, uh, what's it called? Bay, Bevy, Bevy Game Template or something like that. That um, it already has GitHub Actions that will do the whole WASM build for you. And if you follow the instructions, you can just and they turn on GitHub Pages where they'll host a static page for you. And then the action will actually compile your wasm and put it on the static page and then you can just browse to it and then you can have that trigger whenever you merge a pull request or whenever you push to main or whatever you whatever you want the trigger to be and then it just does it for you and it's like super nice it's like it's really freaking cool actually you just be like oh my gosh like it's like the game pads even work oh really yeah the sa sound works like Game it, working all the basic stuff works. But it, like in the browser, game pads work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow, that's, that's wild, actually. Though. Yeah. In fact, the hard, the the biggest difficulty I had was trying to deal with the freaking CSS and stuff to try to get it yes. like, <laughs> like to like put it somewhere decent, not not just yes, like the up yes, in the yes, corner. Always the pain. It's it's like oh my gosh. <laughs> I started life as a front end developer, but the fourth time everything I knew became obsolete. I threw my hands up and said, fine, back end. <laughs> that was when Angular 2 came out. It was the fourth time. Um, so that's, so that's, so I'm thinking about like Fortnite. It's like they can try to release that way. Runs on your phone. Why not? The, the, the big uh, drawbacks to, to WASM right now are, um, like it doesn't have access to networking yet much right. Right. and no, it can't can access much as much of your cores and stuff like it's sort of dependent right. on what the browser is letting the wasm engine actually right. access as far as like pure so cpu resources why, why would apple be like, really want to this? so, so it, it does hit limits sooner than a native app but even so, it's really amazing how seamless yeah, it's, it's getting. Yeah. For the you debug you output, did it print? Did it do any tracing? Or? That'll probably happen. That's a good. Uh, uh, I, my, I'm not I sure. Figure out why my I'm sorry. Is <laughs> <to me. laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if they're using tracing or something else. Did you try uh, setting the Rust underscore log variable to debug? It might be a different um, environment variable, but. Super unrelated question. Yeah. I mean, related to Rust, but is it fairly common to import star in Rust? Well, there, yeah. yes. there, there are there are three times when it's idiomatic to 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 use an asterisk in an import. One is the prelude, specifically a prelude something asterisk. Another one is when you're bringing stuff into your testing module to test for unit tests. And the other, the last one is if you have an enum with a bajillion variants, then it using that in a local scope to bring all of the variants in. Okay. Not not usually like your whole file, right, right, but like so inside of one of your self, blocks. Self, 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 yeah. self, cold, cold, star, you're doing a bunch of Yeah. So that's why I teach my students 
as far as I've been able to research, those are the only times where it's like culturally acceptable. But like, do people use it in other places? Yeah, people do. Right. Please don't do it. But like, your your quality libraries and stuff won't ever do that. And all and all your good libraries, libraries will have a prelude. Bundle up all of yeah. the major into a thing, so yeah. it all comes in all of them. Basically, if, if like 80 percent of your people need it, eighty percent of the time, it ought to go in your prelude. And if it, if they don't need it eighty percent of the time, then it shouldn't. What really sucks. The only thing I, I'm not a huge fan of preludes simply because you have no idea where any of the things in the code come from. Yeah. Well, so I, 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 get the part. I go look at GitHub at some open source project. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to do this. Where did that thing come from that they're yeah. using? Yeah. And you're like, oh, I have to like start clone it, that. open it in Rust Analyzer, and then you can or Google use a Rust specific Analyzer. stripe name and hope it's unique enough. Or, like it's it's not easy for yeah. looking at when you're not on the ID. And that's why you try to restrict it to those three situations. Yeah. And honestly, there's not that many libraries where they have big preludes anyway. I guess it depends on the ecosystem you're working in. <laughs> That's also why I love macros. Yeah. I love macros because they're impossible to find. Oh, gosh. Macros <laughs> are a pain in the rear. So do we know of any... Uh, sorry, different, different kind of subject, but do we know of any games that are uh, written in Bevy? That we could that we could play. Other go go look up games. the last bevy game gen. There's like seventy or eighty of them. It's I O. You can and, and they're all bevy. and they're all hosted. Like one of the conditions of the last jam was, they asked everyone to to publish a WASM page for it. Well, there I mean, is. I know that if there is like examples on the bevy engine website too. Yeah, there. Because it it looks. Uh, I'm going to be honest. Pretty pitiful. Uh, when I look at itch.io, which is the only place I've found them. Well, look at the what looks I mean, you got to consider like the lifespan of Bevy. It's been around for like, what, 18 months now? Yep. GitHub's been around for 10 years. Unity's been around for more than that. I think. Oh, wait, this one looks good. Rusty Culver. Um, and it, the other thing you're going to find is that the people who are doing this stuff are mostly dabblers who don't necessarily have a lot of time and money to throw at asset <laughs> management, yep. 3D modeling and things like that. There are a few, if you do the Rust game dev, or this month in Rust game dev, they'll have game updates for some more impressive things, but they're not open source usually. There are people who are trying to turn it into. Well, some of them are, them are like Valoran. What one? Valoran. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's not a production ecosystem yet anyway. That's why it's yep. zero dot versioning, and they clearly say the documentation. You probably don't want to use this for any kind of real game. Yeah, they say if you're set on using Rust and you want to make a commercial game, you should use Godot with the Godot Rust bindings. Wait, then why are we learning Bevy? Why, why isn't Bevy's awesome. Because it's, it's, it's coming, Bevy? man. It's coming. Okay. And this is a Rust user group, not a game engineer. So, group. I thought ECS is actually becoming more popular in other game engines. I know Unity has an ECS yeah. system, and I think Unreal is looking at doing it. But Yeah, it's actually really interesting because the Rust game engines were sort of forced into it. Because of Rust's ownership model, it just it's really hard to do <laughs> the, giant, <laughs> the giant object or the giant everything because of the whole, oh crap, I borrowed the whole collection mutably here. Now I can't touch, mutate it anywhere else. Um, and so, so there was a lot of research put into these ECSs and now it's sort of like flowing back into the traditional C++ game engines. So geez, when, I was, when I first looked at ECS a while back, Apparently, it's one of those things that they used to do 50 years ago. And oh, it kind of yeah. had a lot of favor as hardware got better, and now we're going back to it as we realize, wow, this is a really optimal way to process stuff. Yeah, because it lets you process a lot of things. Well, the other thing is that the whole concept of the, the, the stuff is that it's basically sequential in memory. All of the uh, components of a particular type are basically lumped together. So you can say, I want all the things that look like this. It's basically just scanning through a block of sequential memory, and that's really fast. Yep. Henry Hero did that, uh, one of the first things they, they're doing in C, obviously, not across the all, but like really low level, do everything from scratch kind of game programming. And they start by like, well, we know what our page size is in memory, so we're going to make a page of memory that we then manage like all of them. Yeah, and it's amazing because back in the old days, I'm talking about like 80s, like, Oh, you want to go to memory? You want to process a CPU instruction? It's about the same time. Mm -hmm. But now you can process like, what is it, 10,000 CPU instructions with your locally cached stuff? Or you can go out to memory once. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, 
So if you if you organize your ECS, so it's got all the stuff just co-located right together, mm-hmm. it's way faster for it to just be like, I'm going to look through every single one of these things that are next to each other and pick out the ones that I want, rather than hop around a binary tree mm-hmm. or something like that. There's well, also a good talk from Strange Loop like a month ago. Um, John uh, Romero of id Software oh, talks yeah. about the early days of id Software. It's fun. ostensibly about id Software and stuff, but it's... It's really good just from a programming standpoint, like because that was kind of an era that people have kind of forgotten about, and it's very related to some of the things that Rust is basically forcing us to do again, and it was required because of the lack of hardware back then as well, and right. it just seems like a good idea. Mm-hmm. Crazy. What is ECS? I feel like I missed the jump. Entity Component System okay. is what it stands for, is what the ECS stands for. And it's the setup that, that Bevy uses, okay. where you've got, you spawn an entity, which is literally just an ID. It's just a 64-bit ID. And then you add components to it. And that's sort of like, your entity is sort of like a row in a database. Mm-hmm. And your components are just like, sort of like columns. Mm-hmm. And then you can use, you can query it. You can say, I want to get all the entities that have these components. Mm-hmm. Okay, and now I'm just going to, do what I want to want with these collections of them. You set up the <laughs> indexes, so to speak, so like queries are more efficient or is... No, that's the beauty of the ECS is it's like indexed to the max internally. So what you do is you're basically just like dynamically defining columns and like the values in them and doing your queries. But okay. you don't have to deal with any like with SQL, you're like, okay, I literally need to create this table and I need to actually define an index so you don't manage any schema. That's the nice thing about ECS is you just do it and it optimizes accessing it. It it just components are literally just data attached to an ID. Yeah. And the ECS ECS framework will attach everything, will store it in memory however it wants. But again, the idea is that all of the things of a specific type are stored together so you can iterate through them very quickly in memory as all the same type. But are you always looking over everything? Like, or yeah, that's what, that, that's what that the query is. Uh, if you scroll on the screen to the query that we do, we told it what to look through. Right? Well, so it, we it, it doesn't it doesn't look through everything. The way that the ECS is done internally is so it doesn't have to look at absolutely everything in the ECS. Like when I do this with player, it's gonna be like, okay, you're doing queries with with player. I'm going to make sure that these things with players are quickly accessible by themselves. It to the binary tree. Yeah. Especially well, it's it's well, way more complicated than that. And they've got these, and right. I am no ECS expert, <laughs> so I'm just hand waving. But there's like, if you want to go read the, the pull requests where they developed the ECS and Bevy, huge. They're like, they're like master's theses, seriously. Because there's these people that spend all their time just working on ECSs. And when Bevy came out, it like, like a half a dozen of those people all came and they're like, so oh, here's about. like a viable place where they're actually doing it. Let's all, like there were several different ECF, ECS authors that had written their own standalone ECS that came and worked together on Bevy. And they went through like three or four major iterations of the implementation. Yeah, the first few blog posts talking about the performance improvements every time they made another ECS in- internal change was amazing. Oh. Yeah. And there was almost no change to your user code to get those performance benefits. Yeah, that's crazy. Cool. Just internal optimizations. Yeah. Anyway, and now we just get to use them. But before before we get kicked out or anything, I brought a second edition O'Reilly Programming Rust book to give away. This is a first printing, and they had a second printing, so I went and bought the second printing. So I'm giving away the first printing of the second edition. So anyone would like it? Zero. Bird's kind of cool. So I, I didn't have any like criteria for who should have it or anything like that. So I have a book here. Someone should take it home, give it a nice home. I, it has my notes in it from my one of my read throughs. Oh well, so, well, along those lines, I'm giving away this habit on the floor. In case <laughs> there you go. Take the awesome. books you have to take awesome. the we don't come here just for pizza anymore. So I don't know what the symbol means. It was, 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 it
We could try to do one more feature if you want, or we can just chat. I got my, my I got near pixel perfect collisions working with the round triangle collider. Oh yeah? Yeah. That's great. Like really, really good. There's a rounded triangle one? Yeah, really, really good collisions there. Oh sweet. Let's see if we can get rolling back and forth over it. That's so cool. Travel back is uh, Will you put that in the Discord so I can see the rounded rectangle code? Sure. Although I haven't been on the Discord in a while. Should be that. Is there a plugin where you just need to do a whatever polygon and radius and do fancier uh, colliders? Uh, no, that's what I'm going to write. All right. so like, a, like a starfish is a good example, right? If you wanted like a rounded starfish. Mm -hmm. Like so, so the the bevy rapier plugins support arbitrary. Um, polylines for 2D or meshes for 3D, but you have to define all those points. Mm -hmm. So I, that's what I'm writing for my plugin is an editor so you can actually click around to make the points. Yes. And I want to make it so that that editor... Make it live edit or live reload? Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah. And I, I, I want to make it so that um, so that you can access all of the types of colliders and stuff in my editor just like cycle through i'm like oh i want to arbitrate points no i want to use their ball no i want to use their rounded triangle which i didn't even know they had a rounded triangle that's freaking awesome so, so in Godot, you kind of do a combination of that right where you're like yeah do a little robot guy and you say okay i want a circle and i drag out the circle to be the size of his head and then i want an oval or a rounded cylinder but, right that's what a lot of what a lot of what modern game engines are is tooling to make it easier to define things Right, right now, I mean, Bevy Rapier plugin is like, here's all the code. Just mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want, but but without the tooling to actually, you know, graphically see where it's going to be, or save it to a file, or load it back from the file, it's a lot more work. So is Rapier tied into the ECS? So when the player hits the its collision and bounces off, is that that move state being controlled by? the same ECS system? Yes and no. So the the Rapier engine, no, it's completely separate. It's a completely separate physics simulation that does its own stuff in its own way, doesn't know anything about Bevy. But then the plugin connects that to the Bevy at ECS. So the plugin, what it does is it sort of acts as that bridge where it, 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 it creates the resources and components and entities or maybe not entities, but creates the stuff that it needs to in Bevy and syncs the information over from the simulation right. that you so need. You don't want my mouse controlling of that system and the collision of that right. system to be like in conflict, right? Right. So those components, those are Bevy Rapier plug plugin components, you know, like the rigid bot we did. Mm -hmm. And what that does is, is then the Bevy Rapier plugin has its own little systems that will run and say every frame it'll go through all the stuff and be like, okay, what are all the things with rigid bodies? Is there a new entity that has a rigid body that I haven't seen before? Oh, I'm going to go add it to the rapier uh, simulation and blah, blah, blah. And then the same thing, when, it, when, when you do a physics step, I think that's what they call a frame, uh, a step and change stuff, then it, it's, already, it's already kept track of what, what's over in Bevy and it's going to go grab the stuff that it needs to and copy that over to bevy components so it's it's syncing them back and forth mm -hmm. so technically it might be possible to make it more you know opt a little more optimized if you like wrote it inside bevy or something but physics engines are pretty dang complicated and the people who do them want to do physics engines yeah. and so well they they want to they want to do like like locality iteration right they so they want to use some data structure that's going to do whatever they need to to make their physics fast yeah and that's, and that's not point. necessarily going to be the same thing that's yeah going to make Bevy fast. even if they could eliminate the overhead of syncing to Bevy, they probably would lose in the end because they wouldn't be doing physics optimized data structures so yeah you're absolutely right so yeah interesting stuff so quick interjection do we want to do any more code or we just want to check? I, the things we haven't done is we haven't parameterized 
the triangle and put a bunch of them out, and we haven't put the sound on for when you bump into something. We need sound to like fill up the air. I want to hear everybody's computers yeah? making glass clinking noises. All right, pew, let's, pew. let's do the sound. <laughs> Hopefully, somebody has a few and is going to turn it on. <laughs> All right, let's see. Oh, I didn't do the wind condition either. I forgot to put that hole. Although all I did was I just detected the overlap with the hole, and when you're overlapping, I just print it out to the console. You win. And it would do it every frame. Oh, so you win. Set the, set the <laughs> angular force to something high so the ball starts spinning out of control. <laughs> like a fun win. Yeah. You know what? I'm, I think I'm just going to punt and go get the... Uh, the pre-made one and show you the code because technically we only have two minutes left. So if I want to do a perspective yes. game like Super Mario RPG, I would need to do a 3D game. I don't know that game. What's What do you mean by perspective game? Uh, I submit Super Mario RPG. Isometric, I think that's the word, yeah. Uh, Bravely Defaults, uh, the, the Fire Emblem. Uh, basically a 2D game that you can you have depth on. Okay. Yeah, it's an isometric, but it's 2.5D uh, 2. sometimes it's called, but it's all a 2D engine. Oh, it is a 2D engine? Yeah, most of the time. Because like, if you jump you up in an isometric game, well, you're really jumping you, that way. Specifically, I'm like, referring to Super Mario RPG. <laughs> yeah. so it's a 2D game. You but, can well, do... Paper you, Mario. Yes. Yeah, the way that it's implemented. You can do 3D rendering, but use the 2D um, physics engine. That's how... I, um, what is this? You said Braille default, not Rock Path Traveler. Never mind. Uh, well, I maybe mean, we talk about Those two are the same, right? It's it's not, a lot of folks. I don't know if you can think about it. But... Yeah, you're looking like like a two day no. top down dungeon crawler <laughs> where the pillar <laughs> looks 3D. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean. It's kind of like a, it's, it's pre rendered stuff that's overlaid in the right ways, like yeah. Donkey Kong Country. <laughs> It was not 3D, but it was rendered in 3D for the 2D sprite. On the same so computer that they rendered Jurassic Park, by the way. Um, I think it was oh, my next <laughs> YouTube channel is I Heart the Beast. That is a whole like, a little bit of top down series. I think you're done. Where's the sound? So it's, it's okay, so this is this has got the sound code in it. So post in my stuff for Discord. Okay. We'll do it just a second. So the sound code looks like a beast. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. Collision sounds. Okay, so there's something called the Rapier Context. I grab that, and I grab the audio resource and the asset server resource. And then I do this little thing. I set up a little Boolean to false, and then I loop through all of the contact pairs in Rapier. And if any of them have active contacts, that means I am touching something else right now, or this frame, then I say just collided is true. And down here, we load the sound and we play it. Now, asset server load caches what you do. So if you do it again and you've already done it before, it's just going to go straight to it. So that's not, it doesn't actually reload it every time. That would be silly. Um, and then we just call audio play sound. And for this contact pair thing to show up, we had to add one more component to the physics, at least one more. So I'll give you a second there. Oh, and then of course this is a system, so I add, I did the add system up at top for the collision sounds system. And then to make it all work, you need to go to This player. Yes. This right here. Active events, collision events. You have to insert that on your players. Otherwise, you won't get those events. So I'll go back down there. And that was enough. Now, this has the drawback of if you're actually rolling across something or you're sliding across something then every frame it launches it 
So this is a poor man's one. You probably want to add some debouncing timer or something where you only launch it so often or something. Or there's probably some other way to check the actual force of your bounce. Or you just, just be more... You probably need to be a little bit more clever about it. But I was just in a hurry. I was like, we got to get this working. So, yeah, you can hear it. Let's, let's go around again. But that's only one condition. That's not. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of computers now. Anybody want to do a second controller? I'll so, do in, it. so this one, the one, this is the one on my GitHub account. If you go over this end thing, it just spits out to the console player one wins because I didn't have time to go do a text thing. I oh, figured. Oh, let's say player two wins or player two wins. Yeah, uh, player zero. I don't know. Our player I can't. Zero. Computer right. science, come on. <laughs> I I sure. Doesn't PHP start in one or something? Oh, I can't, I can't remember. I, I disavow PHP. Where did you go? It was like, whoa. And it's just, you're gone. It sounds like I do what I always do when I pick something. You You went off to the left. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and he disappeared once he touched it. Watch. Oh, now he can't go. <laughs> he's gone. Oh, he came no, he's back. back. Yeah, it will come back. <laughs> Why did you lie to me, AJ? Hey, I pressed strike. <laughs> what I want to know is how come this game doesn't have a uh, bounce? Oh, he didn't make it. He missed it. Yeah, you need world there boundaries. Is that I love that you had to like lead him in there as Chase. <laughs> Yeah, I totally need to get your better triangle. Thank you. I'm going to go get the better triangle. Better triangle. Where's Discord? What? I was just in the middle of that. We need a better triangle, man. I feel like their collider has a lot of like standard shapes as constructors. Yeah. Like, everybody does this. We're just going to make it easy. Yep. Oh, you want random weird polygon? You're not that's that's the nice thing about newly built stuff in Rust. Too. They're looking back at decades yeah, worth of stuff and being like, let's just do all the nice stuff. Does Discord always have an update? Yes. Yeah. This is how Electron apps work. <laughs> so they went off to Discord is Oh man. So, yeah, There's a lot Jordan, into. doing that Tory presentation. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh, I think we were going to maybe try it for next month, but then it was colliding with holidays and stuff. No, that we moved. We moved it a day into the next month. Yeah. I don't remember that. Oh. It was a big you discussion. Saw, yeah, Everybody was talking about it. Are, if you want. There were no <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true, but I got this far. I might as well. Put it in chat. It, yeah. It was, yeah. It was really legit. Emojis. Yeah. Holy emojis. Emojis. I mean, I mean if it doesn't involve emojis, is it really voting? There it is. This one? Yeah. Oh. I've had to teach so many people how to do a poll on social media. All right. Triangle. Whoa. Toot. Toot. It's all right. We'll fix it. So the thing that tripped me up for a minute was that it expands the triangle. Mm. So the the radius by is like that. It, you expand the whole triangle by, and then I don't know what that number is. It must be a percentage. It's it's like a percentage of something because when I set it to like five, which I thought was normal, I was getting some really strange behavior where <laughs> it was like the size of the entire screen and it was shoving all of the other colliders off the screen within like three yeah. frames. And so my balls were disappearing and it took me a while to figure That's out what I did. Okay. I don't know AJ. What yeah, oh, that, oh, oh, that oh, is okay. so nice. Look at that. It's crispy. That's just beautiful. Yeah. Ah! I feel my wrath. Yeah, I get that. Real estate sound. It's amazing. Huh. Look at that. It's like a real impact of a glass ball or something. Get off. That's my. My stuff doesn't bounce off. As I win. To get anything close to the movement speed, I have to go like fifty thousand. So what the heck? Huh. Are you on your Linux pixels, or Windows? Your pixels per meter, the size of the the collider. 
Because I mean, everything that I can see is exactly the same. The mask defaults to. The we need to get. We need to get items, get, obviously. Yeah, you get my need, red shell. We need, yeah, we need power ups. And also, <laughs> what about use, having uh, the ball rotate? Uh, or, oh, it does rotate. It does actually does rotate. Yeah, it does. Wait, why? It has really high angular damping, so you'll only rotate a tiny bit when you're touching something. That's that's right. If I turn it down, you'll keep rotating more. In fact, I should turn it down. Let's. Turn, why is that damping so high? Damping. There it is, right there. See that? Let's change it to like zero point three. So I now have like a virtual D pad using the D pad. Oh, by the way, uh, Bevy supports okay. live reloading okay. for all of the assets. Like from Anything you do, asset server dot load on. To work. It'll go check like a lot. And so like it's really useful if you're if you're like working on a sprite or something and keep changing it. You can have your Bevy window open in one end window. And then like your editor program on the other one, and as long as you just keep writing the file, it'll just keep updating in your Bevy program. It's What's the resolution cool. on your screen? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it may be. What is well, the resolution? It's, it's, it's the whole screen? I think it's the pixels per meter. 1080p yeah, is... I'm on 1080p. I'm but guessing it's... you're at something higher. Than oh, no. Me. I'm like way higher. Like 2880 or something? Yeah, well, no, we get the real resolution or the. Uh, are we talking about the virtual resolution of the window? Are we talking about the resolution of my monitor? Oh, whatever Ray Pierce sees. Oh. I don't really care what. If it did it right, it's supposed to see this default size of 1024 by 768 it's, virtual pixels. For instance, I, I remember like in web. Where did you put when me? Redneck came out, it would. It Where you belong? On, on the web page so that uh, it was the correct. It would look the same on the <laughs> Mac OS messes with pixels to try to handle things that don't do retina. That's why you have retina assets and things like that. Mm -hmm. it's a huge pain when you're writing apps. <laughs> no kidding. Okay, now write these 43 variations of icon sizes. So it'll work on all iPhone and Android got, devices. If you ever do oh Xcode stuff and you go like, I've got an image, it's like, okay, here's how many different varieties of size <laughs> you can give it. Yeah, I really wish they had like a, num like a, a constant. You could just say, you know, it defaults to one, and if you don't use it, then they just multiply everything. But if you do use this one magic constant, then you can just multiply the few things that you care about by two. Problem solved. You don't have to make an entire API layer just to handle different images. <laughs> yeah. It, can you can you do a static coefficient of friction? Is there is there something for that like yeah. happening? You can you can change the friction. Yeah, stamping is in here already. Well, no, but the thing friction. is... Talking about friction, object against object. Well, uh, no, I mean like damping, but... So generally, oh. an object will roll, but it won't, inf you know, won't, it won't infinitesimally slow down by a fractional point. At, at some point, it gets slow enough that it just stops. Yeah. Right. It's doing that by default. It does that. So if you look real closely, you'll actually see the, yes. the color of the debug rendering will change color when it, when it goes into rest mode. Okay. And it's, it's kind of hard to see right there, but it, it does change color. It, it just it goes yeah, here. for a very long time. I'll turn on the debug That's render. You can, ah, yeah. dang it. Um, actually does work. Okay. Where's my plugin? Yeah, so, Jordan, I think, I think what we decided was that we're not doing November, but we're doing the, the first week of December, and then we're doing both the first week yeah, and the last close. week of January. Yeah, yeah it did change from, from dark blue to purple. Okay, well, if, if not, then we just skip. But we still have December. You can see, yeah, but beginning of December, the lighter is now way broken. Whoa! Once it expanded the pixels out, distance wise. Um, so, so are you saying I didn't choose either of those? So the pixels per like, meter shouldn't change that. Apparently, it does. Because that's all oh. I changed. Now it does that. Oh, are you using the rounded you triangle? I can't use either of those. It's that. Uh, it's that percentage thingy. Oh, uh, sure. Is it that that percentage thing the, is, is, like is affected by the pixels per meter. Let me check and see. Let me see. I wonder if that's intended or if it's a bug. 
I think we just we just it's, huge it's things no, over. So totally you were already right. set up for. It, it, does, it is bigger. I don't think I, mean, I, would I need to turn down this. But yeah. I thought we had probably so that's just either just interesting title and food. Thing, but it's probably a bug. Oh wait, this hasn't pixel, been updated yet. Yeah, yeah, see, it's going to be there. I'll go ahead and update this. You're doing the points in pixels. Why not do the radius? It should be in pixels. Yeah. So it probably yeah. assumes your so pixel you per meter is one, which I believe is the copy. default, I mean, and they just didn't. Yeah. They didn't I do the math to yeah. change it. Yeah, so that's a. Budget. That's something we could go and fix in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. I've actually. Uh, I think I've actually. Uh, I think I don't remember if I've done the pull request, but I've done something to Ben. Yeah, they're really good. Just the ratio. The the ratio folks are really good at. Accepting like the meters and stuff. Well, like when you when you tell it what yeah, the lighter is based on the PM. Do you want to do it the summer first? There's no. Can you, can you I'd rather do the lighter in the middle of a pixel. Doesn't that's not you know, the pixel. It would be like it's right here. It's a floating point value, so technically there's no pixels at all. It's all so going to be floating point recognition, and it's really a marriage of like what is displaying versus what coding for that value. Well, I what think we learned is apparently it absolutely does affect how it renders on certain things. It's like, it's supposed to. Uh, yeah, most of those things will be bugs. So good opportunities for contributions. You just inherited some work. You think you think I understand the math well enough to do a contribution? That's, wow. that's, huge. that's how you learn as you try. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and um, officially close this. I have to go here pretty soon. All right. So, Many, 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 many plus ad infinitum, many more thank yous Ooh, to thanks. Nathan for You're welcome. the presentation. All of them, Nathan. Um, when are you going to do the next one? <laughs> <laughs> I just did two in a row, and you're asking me already? I don't even know what to do next. Memories open. We're expecting a game to do some launch. We can make uh, Excel. We're all going to cut up a profit. Excel? Oh, boring. Excel. Um, thanks again to Vivint and particularly Jeff for hosting us. Um, and anybody online, if you got any last questions uh, or jokes, go ahead and ask or crack them now. Um, uh, I'll just turn this off in two minutes. Um, Controller? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. But that, was, that was awesome. Thank you. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. I switch it back to the regular triangle collider. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, the little number multiplier, you could probably just take it way down or even multiply it by the that's, pixels per meter. I don't think any more questions are coming. That's not consistent across all Why do you have to hold no, the power button for 10 seconds? It, uh, I'm, 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 I'm,